I'm Glenn McGuinness, and this is Outburst. On the program, are private clinics a solution to Canada's healthcare crunch? I mean, that's definitely kind of a double-edged sword. I really do think we need them. If they make it work, it's going to help everybody. It's just not the Canadian way. As the healthcare crunch in this country continues, countless Canadians are still without a family doctor, and surgical backlogs continue made worse by the pandemic. Several months back, the province of Ontario pondered allowing some private and public clinics to take on surgeries, which could range from knee and hip replacements to cataract surgery. While some think this plan may look good on paper, critics say it will just take workers out of the hospital, leaving patients behind. So we took to the streets to see what you think about this. Our question. Are private clinics a solution to Canada's healthcare crunch? Well, I, pray, I paid for a private MRI, uh, and it happens so much faster than um, waiting in line for the public one. And I'm sure maybe I freed up a spot for somebody else. The idea, I guess, of having um, pay as you go is why can't you put that into the public health healthcare system and combine the forces in one uh, one healthcare system as opposed to trying to split it up, and then you end up with people who can't afford to pay the private clinics. Uh, missing out, out in the health care that other people can afford. So I, I'd like to see it distributed even, evenly, and I don't know if you can do that with uh, private health. I believe they are not. I don't think that capitalism should be involved, part of public health care. Well, I feel they would help. We, we have to try different things. So this, give it a whirl, see if it works, see what happens. Status quo is not acceptable, so... To be able to pay more and get better treatment or quicker times, ethically, I could see the issue there. Um, if it's a private thing, I can see the benefit, but I think the, you know, just kind of improving the what's available to everyone should be kind of the focus, I guess. Some people will be left out. You know, we got to go back to uh, old Tommy Douglas's uh, way, the uh, public uh, health. I do. I really do think we need them. Uh, the services would be faster. Pay for it. We get, people are walking on bad legs for years and years. It, and then it makes their body, the rest of their body, suffer for it. So we need we need private health care. Yes, I think they will help immensely. Um, for those who have the money to use them, uh, maybe the waiting lines are are uh, reduced to the point where those who can't afford private care will maybe have better access to public care. No. It's just not the Canadian way. Th th that's just my opinion. It's just not the Canadian way. You know, like we expect our government to pay for our health care. Right, that's why we pay our taxes. Then why have private clinics? Yes and no. Like, well, it would be a shame to give away our, the kind of health care we have now, which has been taking care of its people for years and years. On the other hand, there's so many people, and if people can afford to pay for something, it frees up beds and, and uh, hospital care for, for the people that can't, right? So they've got more opportunity. It, it's, a tough, uh, it's a tough one. Yeah, but I think both. No, I don't think they are. I think that everyone has the right to free health care, and I think that um, health care should just be a human right. Everyone should be able to feel good all the time. If some people, I'm not saying everyone, but if some people can afford he private health clinics, then why not? At least we have a backup options for some people to get cured and get right medical treatment on right on time. So why not? I'd say no. I would prefer that we continue to support public health through government dollars. Yeah, I just hate to see it go to the place where not everyone can get free and easy access to health care. That is a very good question. I don't think privatized health care is the way to go, but that's my inner hippie um, speaking out. Um, I think health care should be accessible to absolutely everyone, whether you're rich or whether you're like me and you're broke. Um, so I don't, um, I don't think privatized health care is the way to go. It makes me nervous and I just, it, it, doesn't bring good things with it, I believe. Yes, they are. And I, I think for, it would take a lot of stress off the public health 
system where those who can't afford to pay for private health care, if you want to choose to pay for private health care, um, you should have that option. My mom's a registered nurse, so I think our health care system is, it's not perfect the way it is, but I don't think going private's the answer to any of the problems. I think more access is necessary, not less. So making things private just makes it harder for people in situations, tough situations to get access to it. So I don't think so. I work in healthcare. So I, I see it from both sides because I'm also a parent with sick kids. So um, I think I think the real the real thing needs to happen is funding more uh, more university positions for um, nurses and doctors and um, making those positions available to local people without having to bring in lots of people from other places. It could be part of the solution, but I'm very convinced that there are a lot of talent pool just wasting away because it can't go right into the system right away. Yeah, we're not getting the best care, unfortunately, with our, with our current system. And ultimately, I think you do have to take care of your, you have to be your biggest advocate with the healthcare system. And if that means you know, spending out of your pocket to get better treatment, sooner treatment, then that's an option, I guess. It's not for everybody, obviously. Staffing is a real problem. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in healthcare or you're in restaurant industry, teaching and somewhere maybe private clinics can make a go of it they're private entrepreneurs and if they make it work it's going to help everybody 100 percent, no <laughs> i very very much disagree with private health care there's a lot of research showing that it does not shorten wait times that it does not deliver a healthier population or better care uh, to our population i work in health care and i am adamantly opposed to privatization. I think this would be kind of the end of the Canada um, that we're proud of and, and Canada as we know it. We need healthcare for everybody, not only those who are in kind of, you know, the upper income brackets and can pay for it. These days, keeping your head above water financially has become more and more of a vicious circle. The housing market compared to 10 years ago is drastically different and rents have doubled and even tripled in many cases. Saving some money for retirement is becoming less of a reality, especially for younger people. We took to the streets to find out if your monetary outlook down the road is looking positive or are you in crisis mode? Our question. Are you feeling good about your financial situation in the future? Honestly, as a kid um, who just moved out, it's it's tough. With um, I work a retail job, so it, it is kind of like paycheck to paycheck pretty much. And I know a ton of people in my situations and who are stuck in my situation and will be for what seems like the rest of our lives. Outstanding, I just paid off my mortgage this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I, I, uh, I, I think there's a little bit more stability now that even, even though we've, we've had interest rate hikes, I think that, that uh, keeping inflation under wraps is, is something that's important and that seems to be about the only way you're going to be able to do it. So uh, short-term pain for long-term gain. No, no. Um, I am on disability with the province. Um, it's very dire for a lot of us. Um, the province gave us a pay raise of $30 a month. It was a big slap in the face. Um, you know, most of us are living on about 300 to 400 dollars a month for groceries, clothing, uh, personal items, anything else. Um, so once your rent and things are paid, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. Yeah, I'm OK. I'm retired. So um, anyone who's young out there, I'd be really concerned about what what's facing them ahead with high interest rates and cost of everything going up. I'm concerned for them. Not right now because uh, the prices of everything are skyrocketing and it's, and it's causing a strain on myself and my family. So I think, uh, you know, we have to change our diet. We have to change the way we eat because of the price of food and travel also. Like we, we can't travel like we did in the past. So we know we have to cut back on other things so that we can be able to survive. I feel good. Yeah, I think Saskatchewan has lots of opportunity. Um, we have a low um, unemployment rate. I think there's, there's, I'm feeling good overall. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm 
pretty concerned about some of these new uh, federal policies that are going to increase energy prices and uh, increase the cost of living just to uh, uh, on the average citizen. It's crazy. Um, what could a hundred dollars could uh, get you before was not what it is now, and. Yeah, I definitely feel like that's interfering with uh, being able to like run a business or or maybe even have a family. It's it's tough because you know you never know what the the future is going to be like. You know, right now I'm just a, a student, so it's kind of tough right now because I'm just balancing all finances and work and you know uh, social life. Uh, but uh, in the future, I I feel like there, I I am confident. I'm less confident about certain things, but. Like, uh, like housing, like, oh my gosh, it's impossible to get a house nowadays, but. Not especially, no. Um, I think it's been a really challenging time um, for a lot of people, uh, you know, with uh, increased interest rates, the cost of housing has risen dramatically uh, in most places. And I think it's really changing. Our country has been changing for a while now in terms of, you know, the the middle class kind of dream and the, you know, having a stable job that can help you uh, achieve financial independence, own a home uh, and save for a decent retirement is no longer a reality for most people. Even those who have, you know, university education and really, you know, good jobs. I'm fortunate in the fact that I've got a private retirement plan um, that I paid into for years. And now I'm doing consulting and I'm okay. But there are many, many older adults that are not okay. So for me, I've got my favorite charities and I'm doing my best to take care of them. Yeah, obviously uh, things are a concern, but, uh, you know, with inflation and whatnot. But uh, no, I'm still still optimistic about it. I feel pretty good about my financial situation in the future. Um, got a pretty good job transferable skills, that kind of thing. So I'm never worried about that. Uh, my partner also, uh, same thing. So I feel good. Uh, overall, yes, I'd like a little bit more government support. I'm not opposed to something like a universal basic income. I think that would solve a lot of problems that people at lots of levels are facing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that um, inflation is kind of posing a problem to people. I've definitely noticed when we go grocery shopping, um, but Generally, I'd say yes with an asterisk. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Well, you know, when, when COVID came, um, I took a, um, what was it called? It was a, def I deferred my mortgage. And I was lucky because I had a fixed mor mortgage rate. Okay, so people that have not got one, uh, they're, it's through the roof what they're paying. My mine comes up for renewal in uh, February 24. So we'll see what happens. But I think they're going to renegotiate um, people's mortgages and what they have left. But it's supposed to be a lot higher, right? So I don't know. I might have to move. But on the other hand, there's no place to rent anymore either. Uh, uh, I mean, nobody has money, so I guess that's OK. I don't know. I don't have any. Nobody has any. It's. So I guess no, actually, no. <laughs> no. The Golden Boy statue can be observed on top of which provincial legislature? PEI, Quebec, or Manitoba? Oh, that's a good question. PEI, I think. <laughs> PEI, Quebec, or Manitoba? PEI. It's a tough one. It can't be Quebec. Uh. Golden Boy. I'd say Manitoba. Quebec. I know the answer, but I'm going to let these two go first. Uh, Manitoba. PEI? Manitoba. Manitoba. PEI. Manitoba. You are correct, sir. All right. Good for you. Yay. Every smart man has a dog. Right. Well, she gave me the answers. Atop the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba stands the Golden Boy statue. Although it may be difficult to judge from a distance, the statue is 17.2 feet in length and faces north. It holds a sheaf of golden grain in its left arm and a torch in its right. The statue signifies a youthful runner and a bright future. 
The figure was cast in Paris in 1818 and before coming to Canada, survived an aerial bombing in World War I intact. Except for several months in 2002, the Golden Boy statue has stood at the very top of the dome on the Manitoba Legislature since 1920. Unfortunately, poverty is a problem in practically every major city and town in this country. So many of us have to make the choice of either paying the bills or putting food on the table. And of course, thousands of Canadians are sleeping on the streets every single night. We sent our cameras out to ask people what actions are being taken where they live to help those who go without each and every day. Our question. What is being done to address poverty in your community? Just driving around the city, different areas, you see you know, blatant you know, poverty, homelessness, that kind of thing. And it doesn't look like there's anything really tangible being done. Um, from a, like an optics perspective, it looks like the problem's getting worse. Um, you know, with crime, it looks like it's going up. And then, especially if you're driving down Main Street, North Main, it's just, uh, it looks like there's a lot, of, a lot of issues there with homelessness and that kind of thing and poverty. So, yeah, I haven't really seen anything. I'm not sure what enough is. Our food banks are, ta are being tapped out. And the only reason why they're being tapped out at this stage is because people need help with food. And if you don't help, help with food, then what? Then we end up with mental health. It's a vicious circle. Um, that's a good question. I'm from the Kaluids. Um We've got the shelters available to them and um, the place to get food, uh, not far from the Anglican Church. That is, uh, is what I'm aware of. In the Kaluids? Um, I'm hoping there's lots to be planned. I'm not quite sure to be totally honest, but I know there should be more food available and more places to go that's not a business. And I hope there'll be more places for people to go and sit down and feel welcomed and have activities to do and access to some snacks and some food. And I also hope that there'll be more fun programs where uh, people can use their hands or their skills to do something uh, and not just kind of be stuck to hang around stores in our community. Food insecurity is a big problem where I stay. Uh, I'm from Clyde River and we only have one store. Things are very expensive. Uh, flights are limited coming in. So there is, there, there's an issue for people, uh, underprivileged people or people in need in our community. Um, really, I think it's just the, the community centers are, are the biggest help to, to people in poverty right now. Things like, uh, things like food drives and, uh, community center like outreaches like there's a there's a church by me that um that does housing for them uh like during the night time so i think that's probably the biggest uh thing helping poverty in my community at the moment is there ever the poor are always with us from biblical days and before and will be and and that's not a good thing but we only do what we can do and we're doing the best we can, I think. We have unemployment, and yet we have no workers. So how do you justify that kind of thing? Honestly, I do not know, uh, though, I do think we should start implementing some other things that uh, our countries do, like, for example, France. Any unused, gro like, unsold, about to go bad groceries should be able to be given out to those who need it since it's just going to go in the bed anyways, right? Uh, no much. Uh, I think we need more housing. It's a lot of homeless people in, in Edmonton. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Uh, no, lots of people volunteer their time, but help from the government, I don't think we're getting any. So it's, it's kind of sad. I see a lot of homeless and stuff like that, so it's... So obviously nothing is being done, I don't think. Not enough. Go for a walk and you see way too much going on. And it's an issue. We're talking about building a new library and building a new rink and we got people laying on the streets everywhere. It's an issue. And it doesn't seem to be the most important one, unfortunately. When I was homeless, um, I was, um, it was uh, in issues with addictions and with, um, with uh, depression, so the, uh, I, 
big way to address that, I think, and, and how to tackle that, I believe, is um, by addressing mental health problems and addictions issues, which I don't think there's enough being done. We there. I mean, when I tried to get into rehab, for example, it took eight weeks to just to you know be accepted and so that is a huge problem i don't think there's enough funding for mental health services i don't think there's enough funding for addiction services at all i, I belong to saskatoon west and there's quite a lot being done there uh, there are churches and there are agencies and that's where the h homeless people have been relocated not enough is being done well, not much that i've seen personally and that's very disappointing, especially walking down this street in specific. You get a lot of people that are hungry or just they don't have a place to stay, which is unfortunate. Nothing is being done to, nothing real is being done to uh, fight poverty. It's just a lot of bells, whistles, and buzzwords that governments are saying and doing. Like we're trying to like legalize drugs, which I think is a good thing, but also, there's no infrastructure in place to make it work, so it's all just for show. Well, I see a lot of agencies trying to help with food security issues, um, providing food and, and things like that, and of course the food bank. Um, I see some agencies are um, working toward um, getting a living wage for people as a minimum for income. Um, and so, you know, I see those things developing. Canada is one of those countries that has it all. We're surrounded by three oceans. We have the mountains, the prairies, and in every nook and cranny this country has to offer, you're likely to find something you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere else. We sent our cameras out to ask Canadians what it is about where they live that sets it apart from anywhere else. Our question. What makes your part of the country unique? Saskatchewan, um, I don't know, it's a beautiful part of the country. You know, there's lots of farmland, lots of wide open spaces. You can watch your dog run away for three days. It's kind of the running joke, but I think it's true. And you fly in, you kind of understand where that joke comes from. Uh, the Rough Riders is kind of a unique uh, sports franchise in, in Canada. So if you've never been to a rider game, I'd recommend coming here and, and taking one in. Here, the thing that stands out is a sense of community because we're so far away from things and um, yeah, you know, when you're in a big city, everyone kind of, you know, doesn't really look out for each other and just kind of does their own thing. And I think, yeah, just looking out for people and, and caring and wanting to be a part of the community. They need to talk more about everything that we have to offer, like uh, the, the art scene, we have world-class ballet, symphony, uh, theater center, opera. And we've got all the sports teams that you need too, uh, the Jets and the Bombers, so, uh, and, and great cottage country just very close by as well. So it's a great place to live. There is a part of the, the flatness that I like. Not a lot of it, but just some, you know, it makes you wonder, like when you're driving down to any part of the city, I mean, outside the city, and then you just see how flat everything is, just, it looks like there is no end to it. It just keeps going, you know, it's, I don't know, it's marveling in a way. <laughs> people don't like that, some people don't like that, but it just, I find it all inspiring. I think our cold winters probably make people, um, you know, focus a lot more on their hobbies. Um, so we have fantastic musicians that come out of here. You know what, I think it's still a very affordable place to live. Uh, the weather's decent, it's not great, but it's not terrible. Um, but at the same time, I think this is a fine place for people to bring a family and, uh, and do well. Uh, the fact that we've got the Rocky Mountains and then we've got a Drumheller, you know, we have an eclectic collection of, uh, of landscapes here. So that's what I love about it, right? So I'm outdoorsy, so I love, you know, if I want to go to the mountains, I go to the mountains. If I want to go to the Badlands, I can go to the Badlands. If I want to go deep into a forest and get lost, you know, just go north, right? So, no, it's, it's a great place to live, so. Almost every day I walk, um, you know, up the White Avenue, I don't walk up every day, but every day that I go out of the house and walk through the community, it's different. There's a festival on in the summer and there's many of them on. They block the streets off. It rains, it snows, it's cold, it's warm. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you wouldn't get that in San Francisco. You wouldn't get that in San Diego, right? Oh, 
I came here 40 years ago for two months and I never went away. I love it here. The prairies are space. Uh, I have a friend who used to belong in the prairies and he lives in Montreal. He says it's like living under a duvet. So uh, this is where you can breathe, not too many people. And uh, oh, this is a wonderful part of the world, wonderful part of the world. And I'm very grateful for it. Especially around festival season, the arts, the community, the vibrancy here, it's absolutely amazing. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, people are from Saskatchewan are amazing. It, get it done kind of attitude. And you know, we live through the, some of the best climates and some of the worst. And, uh, it's just amazing to be living here. Uh, a lot of people uh, in the southern part of our country don't uh, understand how beautiful it is here and how rich the culture is and how amazing uh, the scenery, the communities, the lifestyle is in this uh, territory. And I, uh, I believe being from New Brunswick and not learning a lot about Nunavut when I was growing up, uh, I believe that's another issue we have in our, in our country and I think that uh, we need to bring light to how much beauty there is in this territory. Oh, it's unique because it's from sea to sea. And, and here you see uh, there is uh, the Frobisher Bay and we can go to the sea, uh, the North Sea. So it's, uh, there is uh, many things, but this is one that I find uh, uh, unique. It's a very large country, a lot of diversity. Uh, Indigenous peoples, unique in Nunavut. Uh, it's a vast country, um, beautiful wildlife, beautiful country. I love the climate here, even the cold winters I can take. Um, I love the closeness to the mountains and the ability to get around. Uh, and uh, although Calgary itself is growing rapidly in the years I've been here, it's still a small city compared to a place like Toronto where I'm from. I would say the mountains, like having access to the mountains and being able to be so close and like the, the freedom um, to just kind of hop and skip out of town. Uh, I lived in Toronto for a minute and I remember it took so long to get out of the city and it's just, it's nice to be able to get out and um, yeah, how much sun we get. It's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGuinness, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.